In this special edition of Nebraska Stories, we explore our favorite destinations from across the state. From Toadstool Park in the west to Taylor Village in the Sand Hills, all the way to the North Hills of Omaha. These are some of our favorite Nebraska adventures. big appeals of this place is how quiet it can be in the solitude you can find here. The maze that the time frame to build up the formations and then the slow erosion that uncovers what was done. Toadstool is always changing, it is always evolving. There are layers of sandstone. Between those layers of sandstone there are layers of clay. Clay is pretty soft. So we get these actual toadstool formations because that clay gets eroded away beneath that sandstone. So you get this huge piece of rock standing on top of this little pillar. It looks a little bit like a toadstool. We saw a picture that was taken up here in the hillside and it looked so unusual. We said, we just have to see it. Are you ready to see some more? Yeah. Okay. So we altered our plan so we could take this in. There's our next post ball too. It is a place where you can actually walk back through time and get a chance to visualize what life was like before we were even here. It's pretty cool you can get to see tracks from critters that were running around here 30 million years ago. We've been hiking a lot, getting into the rock and seeing what we can find. It's just fun for us. I kind of use my hands to climb the rocks and steep. My dad helps me um, find the steep parts. You come out to a place like this and you can't imagine why anybody wouldn't love this. It's just so spectacular. It is a hidden treasure. Toadstool is one of those gems that not many people know about. It's off the beaten path. It's lots bigger than I thought it would be. There's a lot more formations. It's nice to just not think about anything and just enjoy what you're doing, walking around, taking pictures, and not really worry about anything else. That's kind of why I like coming to places like this. Year, I think we were around 17, 1800. It does get a little easier in the sense that we know what has to be done. Well, this is a slip. <laughs> 
gets a chance to meet the artist and um, see their, their recent work. This is how I make my work. These are all the steps involved. A lot of steps. I'm amazed. Yeah, and then they have done a really good job of getting some very good potters. I'm lucky it's my second time. They invited me last year, and I was lucky enough to be invited back. You could really grow a plant. That's beautiful. It's a really appreciated by an artist when a person buys from the artist. That looks like a heart. <laughs> People don't realize the talent that we have in this area. You know, when you get a chance to see the work, I think we're really blessed to have the people that we have here. I think you would like this one. This particular clay has a high iron content, and then depending on how you're firing, whether you're firing with a lot of oxygen, with an excess of fuel, They made 40 dozen kolaches for today. I see it from last year to this is just building more. Buy art, buy local. <laughs> There's Ralph Hodson, Little Audrey, Ralph and Hank, the friendly villagers of Taylor, old-fashioned, kind of stoic folks, a little stiff, wooden, actually. I want as many wooden people as there are actual people in Taylor, which is only 182. I can do it. Mara Sandoz is one of the actual people and creator of the Wooden Ones, her name begs the question, and yes, her husband is related to Nebraska-born writer Mari Sandoz. A couple decades ago, she got involved with a local economic development group brainstorming about ways to help the fading village, which sits on the edge of the sand hills near Calinus Reservoir. What can we do to stop the traffic? What can we create for people to see photo opportunities? And so we went back to, okay, what do we have? We have a couple really cool historic buildings. Let's, let's go back and capitalize on that. Let's go back to that era and let's recreate what was. When this town was booming, when this town was bustling, what did it look like? It became Sandoz's project, a self-described, self-trained artist with experience using wood and paint she hatched the idea of life-size plywood cutouts depicting people who might have lived in the village between 1890 and 1920. Those were the boom years when Taylor had twice as many people as today. The first villagers arrived in 2003. Herbert and Alice near the historic, now unused, Pavilion Hotel. People thought they were fun, they were different. People said, uh, they had to stop and wait because they thought that the people wanted to cross the street. Uh, they'd wave at them. It created a lot of local chatter. The villager population has since grown to about 100 of the cutouts. Sandoz does most of the work with a little help from family and locals. The village development group and sponsoring organizations pay for the supplies. She donates her time. A few depict real people but location is often a starting point for the artist. So a lot of my ideas come from seeing a spot. I tend to see canvases 
in the community, what would have been happening there in 1910? Like the yard of Mary Ellen and John Shunnison, home to love-struck villagers Charles and Louise. Oh, I love it. I love it. I didn't know what it was going to be, you know, and it just kind of feels like me and my husband. Do, do people stop? Oh, yes, 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 they stop, come up, take their pictures, write things down, you know, and I think they make the circuit and try and see every one of them. So what's the story behind the, 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 the wooden uh, The wooden thing? people? Yeah. They're a little bit of a tourism gimmick. Um, okay. The villagers caused a pair of westbound travelers to stop by convenient accident in a town square shop called Mara's Treasures. The first reaction, we thought it was real. You know, real, you know, just kind of somebody standing there, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an inviting look to it, you know. It makes you want to find out more about it. So we're, actually, we're uh, thrilled that we stopped here and, and find out this is where they're being made and a little bit about the, the, the villagers, as they call them. Sandoz's shop is something of a byproduct of the project. In addition to displaying work from other local artists, she makes and sells custom mm -hmm. order villagers, about 20 a year. Mm -hmm. These she paints in color. Sandoz believes the Villagers Project is helping the town as a whole. Ladies groups are coming up for day trips. Car clubs are coming up just to drive around Taylor. It gives them a destination point. And they eat at the restaurant and they buy gas at the gas station. And you've begun to bring revenue into your town. But right now, there's only so much revenue the villagers can generate for Taylor because there aren't a lot of places to spend money. Just a handful of businesses in the only town in one of the state's least populated counties. And that population has been declining for decades. Sandoz believes the villagers project can change that. We're creating a really positive climate for antique and retro stuff and so we'll see if we can get some other little businesses around the square that can, can fill those tourism niches. For now, Sandoz will do her part by creating more villagers, six a year until there's enough wooden people to symbolically double the town's population, all with the hope that real people will start coming to Taylor instead of leaving. State is nice, but it almost removes you from Nebraska. Whereas when uh, on Highway 30 or the Lincoln Highway, you went through every little town and you got to see what, what was going on in the countryside much better. If you owned a car in the early 1900s, good luck finding a road to drive on. You could follow the old wagon trails, but a little rain turned those roads to mud. In September 1912, an Indiana man named Carl Graham Fisher imagined the future, a transcontinental highway paved with concrete. He knew he couldn't do it alone, so he enlisted the support of local businesses and communities along the route. And then the cement companies pitched in with something called seedling miles. The cement companies donated the cement and local people helped make the seedling mile to make people realize how great it would be if we had a hard surface road coast to coast. The idea was that if people actually had the experience of driving on a paved road and saw the difference between mud or gravel or dirt and sailing smoothly along concrete, they would clamor for more concrete. And it worked, obviously it worked. Most of it was done with horses. The pavement on Highway 30, and I can remember the original highway, each lane was only eight foot wide, so it was a comparatively narrow road. On November 3, 1915, Grand Island became the second city on the route and the first in Nebraska to complete a seedling mile. Two weeks later came Kearney. Not every community used concrete, 
Elkhorn, Nebraska has the longest stretch of original brick along the Lincoln Highway. Built in the 1920s, this section of highway is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Soon after, gas stations, motels, and diners began springing up along the brand new highway. Places like Shady Bend, just outside Grand Island. When I was around, it was called the motel, but there were the units back there, and that was a pretty, pretty big deal, but it also was a gas station. And like I said, the grocery store, I think that there just weren't places to stop. And so either you had to go to a large city that had a hotel or sleep in the car or whatever. It was really a big deal back in those days to be connected with the Lincoln Highway. There was Lincoln Highway cigar manufacturers, there was Lincoln Highway tires, there was Lincoln Highway oil, and everybody kind of wanted to get in on the act. In the late 20s was when the federal government uh, designated it as a number, Highway 30, rather than the Lincoln Highway. It kind of lost its identity when they uh, gave it the number. When it comes to the Lincoln Highway and, and preserving it, you'll find more enthusiasm for local people to put up plaques in their particular little area than you will uh, border to border. When the interstate went through, then you, we saw a marked decline in, in the, the traffic uh, that it just was not there and everybody traveled the interstate. The interstate is it's just a business route. And so that's why, to me, it doesn't seem like that's really what Nebraska is. I mean, you drive down Highway 30 here locally and compare what you see from Highway 30 to what you see on the interstate. It's two different worlds. Lauritan Gardens was created, first of all, to be a place of beauty and, and enjoyment and engagement for the community. There's a sense of place from the moment you arrive at the garden. If you'd come here in the 70s, it would have been bulldozers and trucks and bare soil and just a horrible sight. It used to be a landfill. In the early 80s, it was capped. You can't build anything on a landfill, so a bunch of garden club folks said, you know, we need a botanic garden in Omaha, and, and uh, this was the place where that develops. To think that you have, we now have a world-class botanical garden here in Omaha at a site that, that a good part of it used to be a landfill is just a remarkable story. We have areas where we can't build anything. We can still do some planting, but uh, as a result, we've kept a lot of open space, which uh, you know, speaks to Nebraska and the Great Plains and that sort of sense of place as well. We use these for prairie plants that have very deep roots. We're trying to understand a little bit more just the, the biodiversity of the place. And as tough as it sounds, that sometimes that means just watching birds and butterflies out in the garden. So we're, we're developing an inventory, tracking those things and day. seeing where they occur. Did you see it fly over there? Yep, it's right there. We try to come every week. Check, well, <laughs> check that one out. Oh, there's our cabbage white again. We're doing citizen science and we're counting the number of butterflies and the species that we see. I'll come out and see 200 in one day. Riddle Larry, 
I think it's this one right there. We're seeing a lot of skippers. We're seeing the orange sulfurs or the white cabbage. We um, saw monarchs. We've seen quite a few painted ladies today. And painted ladies. Which, and then the rare one was the variegated fritillary. That's about yes. the first one we've seen here this year. See, they are uh, something in the back. I just get excited coming out, and you never know what you're going to see. And so you're walking along. Oh, that was neat to see that. Oh, what do we have over there? And Holly will catch a movement, or I'll catch a movement, and we, oh, what is that? Sometimes we see things that are very rare that have never been seen here before. And you go to try to get a closer look at it. And it's excitement of not knowing what you're gonna see. This weekend, I heard a lot of, a lot of really nice things about the beds. We did notice a lot of bunnies in the gardens. My primary role here is working with the plants and the gardeners and make sure they're in the right place and that they have the right resources to take care of the plants on our grounds. We plant 10% of the time. Most of the time we're manicuring, most of the time we're watering, most of the time we're weeding. So a gardener is a very observant person. So that's their role is they're out in the plants, they're looking at the weather, they're seeing how the plants are reacting to the weather. I think there's always a thoughtfulness and there's an intention behind everything done. The new garden that we've been developing, the, the conservation garden, that really showcases the plants of Nebraska. This is another old school horticulture practice. We just make little ones out of big ones and divide it up. Kind of rub the seed a little bit just to lightly scratch that surface, and that helps it germinate. People are familiar with endangered animals like pandas or polar bears or whatever, but the concept of plants possibly going extinct in the wild is, is somewhat foreign. The Conservation Discovery Garden um, is, a, is a place where we can display some rare plants that we're working with. Part of what we do uh, is it's called seed banking, and so we're collecting seed of endangered plants and then we store that here as sort of a backup in case those plants should go extinct in the wild. It's a really pretty place, so it's my first time seeing it. I think it's gorgeous, honestly. I love nature a lot. You don't smell that city air. It smells like nature. It smells clean. It smells refreshing. It's very peaceful out here. It's very calming to just walk through here and see all the different types of plants and stuff, like plants I've never seen before. a lot of beautiful parts of nature. My favorite's here, the trains. I love seeing the train. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it anywhere else in the country. When we have an artist like Craig Mitchell Smith, he had all the red cardinal plants. And so he said, I really want this room to be bursting with red. We had a bunch of red cyclamen that we lined the pathways with. So that way he had that extra red to really make those cardinals stand out. It kind of depends upon the artist and what the artist wants. We try to help the plants help enhance his work. With any of the art pieces, our goal is to integrate them into the landscape, so that's where our job comes in.
To see more Nebraska stories, go to our website and like us on Facebook. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation. Sustained funding for arts coverage on Nebraska Stories is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gindler Charitable Fund.